So that was very, very interesting to me. And that's something I've always been interested in is how nature recovers in the aftermath of these events that we now know have happened. Well, part of it is this, something, and, and we're going to get into this, and in this lecture that I'm giving you tonight is the context for the next three lectures when we really get back into the symbolism of the grail. Because you need to have this framework for really to understand, I think, what the grail is getting at, right? When these cosmic events happen, cosmic material is delivered to the Earth. Platinum group metals is one of the primary signatures. Platinum group metals seem to have very interesting interaction with the biosphere, right? There's also some interesting, subtle hints and indications of the importance of platinum group metals in the alchemical transmutative processes, right? So one of the things that was noticed in the aftermath of Tunguska, now that we have access with the thawing of the Cold War, in the early 90s, we were able, American scientists were able to communicate with Soviet scientists, Russian scientists, about a lot of their research into the region of the Tunguska explosion. And one of the things they had been documenting is that totally undocumented and new, unprecedented species were showing up. mysteries of Gobekli Tepe and why it's now just being uncovered is that it was deliberately buried. It was deliberately buried and it's a huge vast complex of stones and already they've uncovered enough of it to see that the whole thing is an astronomical observatory. Just like all these other structures all over the ancient world were astronomical observatories, right? Which is one of the, the, the critical facts that has to be incorporated into this thinking about the Holy Grail technology because the Holy Grail technology actually is, is, is linking these two domains, terrestrial, celestial. And without looking from that dual perspective, we, could, we would not be able to understand what the, the symbolism of the Grail is actually communicating to us. But in Gobekli Tepe, it was deliberately buried. We had extensive discussions about how Gobekli Tepe was buried, and I was just thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And the reference that I, I think, and, and, and of course I can't prove this at this point, but I have a strong intuitive hunch that the, the reason that it was buried was the very same reason that you bury a, uh, a missile silo, for example. Now, if you remember the story of 1908, what happened in Siberia, this is a critical event, whose, the, the events of which actually uh, convey tremendous insight into the whole grail story. What happened on June 30th, early in the morning, in Siberia, up near Lake Baikal. What happened? Do you know what happened up there? No, I don't. <laughs> Do you, Tim? I don't. Uh, I think you're referring to the... Uh... Tunguska. Yeah. I'm referring to Tunguska. It was a cosmic object, came in to the Earth's atmosphere, moving at a high rate of speed. It began to. It came in at a low angle, so it began to break. As, it, as the air pressure piled up in front of it, it, began, it was like air brakes. And it slowed down, but then it finally, at five miles up in the air, it exploded with the force of a giant hydrogen bomb, and it completely flattened almost 900 square miles of old-growth taiga forest, three-foot diameter trees, just strewn over like new-mown hay, radiating outwards from an epicenter, right? Now, 900 square miles, how big of an area is that? It's pretty big. I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, 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 something that will help you visualize it. If we took the entire perimeter highway, 285, surrounding the Atlanta metro area, the area within that is just over 800 square miles. So you picture now that an explosion of this magnitude coming over downtown Atlanta would pretty much wreck and destroy every building out to Sandy Springs on the north, out to the airport on the south. It would wipe out the, virtually the whole metro area. Okay, so that's about how big that explosion was. And that object 
was a cosmic speck. You know that today, auspiciously today, it's a million miles out, which in the sounds like a long ways, but it's in the cosmic sense, it's it's almost it's it would be classed as a near miss in a sense. There was an object at least a thousand feet in diameter, moving at twenty some thousand miles an hour. That was today, right? Now, if that thing, something a thousand feet in diameter, moving at twenty or thirty thousand miles an hour, hit the Earth, what do you think would happen? What would what would happen in the aftermath of such an event? Well, the immediate area, like if it, for example, landed in the southeast, basically it would wipe out every state, North, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Kentucky, Tennessee would be obliterated, rendered nothing, right? A lunar landscape. The effects would be felt globally. Um, and it would put a pall of dust into the atmosphere that could literally produce what I was referring to a year earlier, two or three years running of agricultural collapses. So in the aftermath, you could expect an object like that, even though Lots and lots of people would survive. Within six months, probably a quarter of the world's population would have succumbed. Now, here's the interesting part. Fifty years ago, when I was a little kid, and some of you in here were little kids, the assumption was is whatever is out there is not much. It's just space is a vacuum, there's not much out there. Right? Geologists believed Everything happens down here, you know. The geologists are looking down here. Astronomers are looking out there, right? <laughs> geologists are, are, are looking, but they're seeing everything here through this lens of gradualism, this lens of uniformity. And they're basically going, okay, everything, we're going to try to explain everything we see as a process of these really gradual processes, one grain of sand, one drop of water at a time. And they did a pretty good job up to about halfway. But then they really began to torture the explanations to try to fit other things into this. This is why they had such a reluctance to, they, to, to admit J. Harlan Bretz and say, okay, you're on to something here, buddy. You've got, you've got something. Eventually, they accepted him. They accepted it. But here's what they did. They endorsed a much larger version of a modern process that has been witnessed in Iceland, Alaska, particularly with the recession of glaciers in the Little Ice Age, what we saw was the formation of lots of what are called pro-glacial lakes, lakes in front of glaciers, or lakes that are being held in by a glacier, right? And in those lakes, the, the glaciers would give way, the, the, and, and the Icelanders had a term called Jokalaups. The Jokalaups was this outburst flood, right? Now, sometimes up in Iceland, there are there's like in one case, there's a, a large volcano that's under the ice sheet in, that, that exists in Iceland. And about every couple of decades, it erupts, right? And it creates a reservoir of water under the ice. And in that reservoir, under pressure, forces its way through the ice, bursts out, and creates a yokel alps or an outburst flood. So the geologist says, okay, you know what? Harlan Bretz originally says, well, there was some unknown process or unknown force that caused an accelerated melting of the ice. I don't know what it is, but there was something and the evidence is in the landscape because all I'm trying to do is show definitively that these floods happened. I don't know how they happened or why they happened. His critics said, well, if you can't come up with an explanation for why they happened or how they happened, they didn't happen, you see. I mean, that was for 30 years, basically, the attitude, right? He said, well, something caused an accelerated melting of the ice, but I don't know what it is. But in the 1920s and 1930s, Nobody was looking out there, see. Mm -hmm. So they missed it. They now, riding horses. What? They were still riding horses. <laughs> a, lo a, lo a lot of them were. But you know, I've seen pictures of, of Bretts in the 1920s with a couple of students out in an old jalopy, mm -hmm. you know, traversing some of these terrains. Mm -hmm. But here you had geologists looking down, astronomers looking out. You had paleontologists also that were looking down. What they were doing was looking at the fossil record in the rocks. Now, come late 70s, early 80s, what we see is the beginning of a major paradigm shift about Earth history. Remember what happened in 1980? It was a big turning point, okay? Three or maybe even four papers were published that year. 
Now, one of, when I was a kid, one of the things that I was obsessed with was dinosaurs, like a lot of boys in the 50s. I was just obsessed with dinosaurs. Couldn't get enough. I had, I had, as a little kid, I had all the plastic models, and I would spend hours and hours with my T-Rex model chasing some guy, you know. <laughs> then when I got to be about 11 or 12, I bought, you know, plastic models and built dinosaurs, and I had books on dinosaurs, and any movie that came out with dinosaurs, I had to go see it. And my favorite thing was this Viewmaster set with 3D views of, from the movie Animal World that came out in the 1950s, right? Now, and I was obsessed with that thing. That was like a, a holy relic to me. I would, I would skip school fake being sick so I could like get in my room and get out my Viewmaster with my different reels and stuff and I would adjust the the blinds just right and position myself with pillows and I would just for four hours just sit there and go into this 3D world. You probably learned more with that than in school. <laughs> well, you know, I think so. And some of the things that were there, I in, in retrospect, I'm looking back and like, there was one called Tom Corbett, not to get off on this tangent, but there was one called Tom Corbett Space Cadet. You ever heard of Tom Corbett? Mm -hmm. Tom Corbett was the first sci-fi television show ever like in the early 1950s. And there was this set of Viewmaster slides. And basically what they did, it was set in the future. And how was it? They were mining the asteroids and they discovered a tetrahedron, right? Well, they remembered that somewhere on the moon, in one of the moon expeditions, they had found in one of the craters a tetrahedron with a capstone missing. And they figured out that this tetrahedron they found on the asteroid would exactly fit on the truncated pyramid that, on the moon. So they went to the moon, they take the truncated, they take the capstone and they put it on the tetrahedron and it turns translucent and there's a holographic, now you got to bear in mind, this thing came out in I think 1951, wow. right? Wow. Same year I was, and here's a holographic image of Mars with a map. And in the map it directed them to a buried sphinx. So they go to Mars, they dig up the buried Sphinx, and it has a lion's head. They open the Sphinx, they go in there, and it was a time capsule left by some unimaginably ancient civilization that was intended to be found by the human species when they had evolved far enough to be able to conduct space travel. I don't know if you guys know who Richard Hoagland is. Yes. yes. Okay, I met Richard, God... Oh, about the time he came out with Monuments of Mars, and he was here in town, and he and I were on a some kind of program together. And you know, by this time, I'd seen his whole scenario with the lions, sphinx stuff that he'd had in Mars. And you know, he, I said, Richard, you know, these ideas, you did, they didn't originate with you, Richard. And he says, What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, at the time, is he old enough to appreciate that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's probably my age, probably a little older than me, a few years older than me, actually. So he's, yeah, I'm sure he was old enough. So I showed him that. And for the next year, he was obsessed with trying to get to the bottom of who wrote that story. And he never could find out. I mean, he went back. It had been, it was, it was Sawyer Toys that did the 3D Viewmaster. They're no longer in business. They sold out to Tico Toys. So he went through Tico found somebody, one employee, some elderly woman with Tico that had come over from Sawyer. I mean, he, he, and he posted this whole thing on his website. You can go on there and read. He's got the whole story on there and how it basically is exactly the scenario that he came up with independently that he wrote about in Monuments of Mars and in a couple of other books. So that was one of my, one of my view masters. Anyways, the other one was the animal world, and it was about the dinosaurs, right? And it was set in the late Cretaceous, and, and then at the end of it, it has this big catastrophe comes and engulfs. The sky catches on fire. There's massive earthquakes. It shows the dinosaurs falling into the earthquakes. And, uh, and then it left the mystery. It said this was one of the greatest mysteries of, of Earth history is what happened to the dinosaurs, see? So for years, that was like this obsession of mine, like, okay, why did the dinosaurs disappear like that? Well, then, you know, 
I grew up, the 60s come along, the 70s, you know, there's distractions. Distractions, yeah. <laughs> They're trying to send me off to Vietnam to die in the jungles. Then there's disco and <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> and so uh well but I never forgot, in the back of my mind, there's still, what happened to the dinosaurs? And was there, in fact, an advanced civilization on Mars? Well, of course, the story wasn't Tom Corbett, was that there had been this civilization that had lived on a planet between Mars and Jupiter, and the asteroid belt was the remnant of that planet. So that, that was the ultimate story there. And what they did was they left the secret to anti-gravity. So at the end, they've got this the tetrahedron there. Oh, at the very first slide, they've got the tetrahedron that's floating above the table, see, the, the capstone. The last one is the guy has got a, some kind of a little disc-like device that he's standing on and he's floating up at the top of the room. You know, and so now this advanced civilization has left us the secret of anti-gravity and the secret of interstellar travel. Interesting story. So, I don't think Hoagland ever did conclude who wrote that. I think he speculated it might have been the Willie Lee, if you ever heard of Willie Lee or Willie Lay, who, uh, who was a pretty far ahead thinker back in those days, along with guys like, you know, Arthur C. Clarke and, and others. But, but nobody, I guess, really knows. And um, so anyways, in 1980, what happens? All of a sudden, it's like, you know, just like with Leibniz and Newton coming up with calculus at the same time. I mean, who was it that said something, maybe it was Buckminster Fuller that said, you know, we get to a certain point where in the, in the ideological um, domain of, of humans, we get to a certain point where it's ready. So like when it's time for steam engines, two or three people mm -hmm. within a short period of time yeah. come up with the idea of steam engines, just like within a, a year or two of each other, Newton and Leibniz both came up with the idea of calculus, right? And okay. Fl flight was the same thing. What? Flight. Flight, exactly. Good, good, good. Right, exactly. So in 1980, you had either three or four articles coming out basically invoking a, a, a extraterrestrial cause for the extinction of the dinosaurs. And that's all it took. That just reignited my whole interest in all of that. And I started going, you know, regularly to the library and reading up and following the debate and the controversy as it, as it evolved through the 80s. And it's very interesting because there were many critics who said, get out of here. We know that the dinosaurs died off slowly and this and that. And, and it was Walter Alvarez and, and his team that discovered the iridium layer. I mentioned iridium in one of the two previous lectures. Critical to understanding the Holy Grail technology is the platinum, the PGMs, the platinum group metals delivered to Earth via cosmic objects, right? They discovered that there was a, a, a globally distributed iridium layer, right? They first discovered it in just outside of a little town called Ande, which is in southern France in the Basque region, which to me was a very interesting place that the first, no, the first place was in, I'm sorry, the first place was in, in Gubbio, Italy. And then the second place where it was confirmed was in, I believe, was in was Ande. Now, Ande is an interesting location because it shows up in one of the most significant works on alchemy published in the 20th century. And apparently, the implication is that Ande may have been the location of a school of alchemists back, like in Renaissance times and Reformation times in there during that, the, the, the peak of, of alchemy. And there's a little uh, stone cross set in a churchyard that's full of alchemical symbolism that's very interesting, and I'm going to be showing you slides of it, okay, because it's, it tells basically the whole story right there, and it's a pedestal with four sides, and then there's a, there's a, a, a vertical shaft, and then there's a transverse arm, and um, very interesting symbolism, and I, I may just pull it up here tonight and show it to you, because it dovetails right in, and, and helps to bridge that gap between grail symbolism and alchemical symbolism, because again, like I said, there's a whole lot of overlap between those two. Anyways, it was this discovery of this cosmic metal layer, the iridium, platinum group metals, at this Cretaceous tertiary boundary. And it's little, like two inches thick is all it was. But they knew that up to this point, they had always found dinosaurs below that layer, but not above. And a lot of the other, the, the marine creatures like ammonites and so forth that went extinct, found below, but not above. And then when Walter Alvarez and his father, Luis Alvarez, they studied this and decided that 
this seems to suggest the imprint or the, the, the signature of a cosmic object like an asteroid. And so they began to contact their colleagues around the world. And so people went back and took a closer look because up to this point nobody had really looked and analyzed that layer, which came to be called the magic clay. But everywhere around the world that they looked, from in Denmark, then in New Zealand, then in southern France, then in North America, they went back to that layer, they looked, and guess what they found? Abundant evidences of cosmic metals. But the critics came out and said, well, no, no, you know, you've got to show us a crater because without a crater, it didn't happen. You know, without a source for your flood, it didn't happen. You know, without a crater, it didn't happen. Well, early 90s, uh, Petroleum Mexico, Pemex, was drilling in the northern Yucatan Peninsula. They drilled down through half a, a half a mile of limestone bedrock, and they brought up this vitrified stuff, this greenish glass that had been melted under tremendous heat. Their first assumption was it was volcanic. But then there was a couple of geologists, Alan Hildebrand and a couple of others that heard about this, and they went down and they started doing more extensive subsurface surveys, and they discovered that this whole thing was a massive circular feature uh, between 130 and 150 miles across. And when they begin to do dating on it, when do you suppose it dated to? Right at 65 to 66 million years ago, exactly the Cretaceous tertiary boundary where the dinosaurs disappeared. Mm -hmm. So this really was the smoking gun, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we see is, and that was in the early 90s. So we've gone from the early 80s to the early 90s, and now suddenly there's this whole new burgeoning catastrophism that's and then in 94 something happens what happened in in july of 1994 does anybody remember what happened in july of 1994 mike what happened in july of 1994 no i know there's one man in here besides myself that knows. You know. We had the first giving it back festival at the Northside Tavern. <laughs> we did? That's not what I had in mind, but I, obviously there's some auspiciousness to that, must be. What happened, Brad? Shoemaker Levy. Shoemaker Levy 9. Crashed into Jupiter. 21 pieces of a cosmic object, we witnessed it, crashed into Jupiter. It was discovered in March of 93, and it was a comet, a single comet nucleus that made a grazing flyby around Jupiter, right? Because of the Jupiter's tremendous mass and gravity field, it tore a single nucleus into 21 pieces that now formed what they referred to as the string of pearls, that, that followed like a train, went around the sun, and 15 months later, one after another, over the second week in July of 1994, boom, 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 21 pieces fell into Jupiter. That was a very mind-altering event for scientists and astronomers who had been looking at this, looking and considering the cosmic environment, because nobody at that point thought that that was anything that we would witness. They came out, a number of them said, God, we just witnessed something that probably only happens once every 50,000 years. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe what we witnessed in 1994 happens a whole lot more frequently than we previously assumed. Now, what we're, we're getting at since 1980 to now, that's 35 years. Now, in the 35 years since those first papers were published, let's consider what's happened here. Geologists have been looking at the Earth, right? And what they've discovered was that, well, first of all, let me back up to the paleontologists, because even before the geologists, the paleontologists were looking at the history of life on Earth. There was a paleontologist named Stephen Jay Gould. You may have heard of him, the late Stephen Gould, Jay Gould. He came up with a theory that he called punctuated equilibrium. And he came up with this in the 70s, actually, a few years before <coughs> the discovery of the iridium layer, and he had been looking at detailed fossil record in Earth history, and he realized that, you know what, it's not a smooth continuum where you, the, the older models was that at any given time, perhaps 10% of the species is going extinct, and 10% of new species are coming along on, online. And so it's just this kind of continuum, an unbroken continuum. 
Well, Stephen Jay Gould was looking at it, and he goes, that's not what it is. And there was a few others, too, about that time. Again, the same idea. You had about three or four of these guys all kind of coming to the same conclusion. It seems like it goes along, and, you, and, and what the fossil record shows is that the, the proliferation of species continues uh, apace, and then all of a sudden, boom, something happens, and the number of species diminishes dramatically for a period of time, and then it restarts again. And this is what he was referring to, punctuated equilibrium. And this, this brought in a, a concept that was dreaded by, Darwinian, by, by dogmatic Darwinian paleontologists which was mass extinction, catastrophe, right? And so they were very reluctant to, to, to go there. However, there it was. You could see it very plainly. You could see it at the Permian-Triassic boundary, at the Ordovician-Silurian boundary, in the late Devonian. There's been five of the massive great events in Earth history where wholesale, the majority of species have suddenly disappeared. And then there'll be this hiatus where there's nothing. Well, there's something, but it's just poverty-stricken fossil record. And then suddenly we see this rapid, what they refer to as rapid speciation. Suddenly here comes the, the species back again, returning in abundance. Now, the mass extinction events at this point are pretty well explained, right? We've got Endogenic and exogenic forces now that are on scales nobody imagined a few generations. Endogenic means from the earth itself. We now know that there have been volcanic eruptions of tremendous violence and force. We also know now that the cosmos has impinged upon the earth far more, far, far more frequently than anybody had even imagined. Now, geologists, while the, while the paleontologists are looking at the fossil record, the geologists are looking and they're discovering every year, they're discovering more and more and more of these impact scars. And now there's hundreds of them. Let's go back to the 20s and the 30s, 30s and there was only one that was known, the, the crater in Arizona. You know, three-fifths of a mile wide, 600 feet deep. And that was it. They accepted, oh, here's one crater. Now there's hundreds known, and those hundreds are pretty much confined to no more than 15% of the land surface. You know, but the continental land surface is roughly one quarter of the Earth's surface. So, you know, all you have to do is go out on a clear night, and I recommend this to all of you to do this as an exercise. If you can borrow or if you have a pair of binoculars, go out on a clear night, full moon, and take a good look at the moon. And what you see is that the entire surface of the moon is covered with hundreds of thousands of impact scars. Now, then while you're looking at the moon, ponder the fact that it's considered that because of the larger cross-section and the greater gravitational attraction of the Earth, it's going to be roughly 80 times more prone to getting struck by objects from space than the moon is. Okay, so now you've got the paleontologists looking at that the, 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 the continuum of life has been frequently interrupted by these mass extinction events. You've got the geologists looking and finding what they were referring to as the discontinuities within the rock record, where something comes and completely interrupts for a short period of time the normal processes of deposition and sedimentation. Now you've got the astronomers looking out into space and discovering that every solid surface body in that we see in the solar system has the same dominant surface features with its impact scars. And at the same time, they're looking into the, inter, uh, the, the zone of space between the planets. What are they finding? That it's far more densely populated with stuff than anybody had imagined 25 or 50 years ago. Far, far more. Now, you see all of this is now coming together in 2015. And like I said, on this very day that we're meeting here, there's an object at least 1,000 feet wide zooming through near Earth space. And it's going to continue to happen, right? Now, the final leg of this is that we now can go with this context of understanding, we can go back and look at the heritage of the ancient tales and stories and myths and, and things that we've inherited from the past and realize that when we're talking, when they're talking about these gigantic floods and apocalyptic events and destruction of the world by water and by fire. Well, this isn't just the, the superstitious imagination, the, the ravings of a, of a pre-scientific, illiterate, barbaric culture. No, what we're seeing here is preserved stories of real events that our ancestors on this planet lived through.
So we put all of those things together, and what we have is a dramatically altered paradigm of the human situation, the human circumstance on planet Earth. Now, when we turn back to these traditions, that's what I want to do is create this framework, this context for looking back at these traditions, whether it's the you know, whether it's the symbolism on the west facade of Chartres Cathedral, the portal of judgment, right? Or looking back at the stories from the, from the Apocrypha, for example, the, the, the Sibylline Oracles and the, the Book of Revelations. We look at that now, and what is the Book of Revelations really? When you read it in this context, hey, this is, this is pretty obvious what it is. You know, and I saw, I saw the great star Wormwood burning as a mountain fall to earth, and it destroyed a third of the life in the sea. Well, I think perhaps what we're seeing here is a literal convey a literal expression of something real that happened. It not necessarily happened at the time the, the book of Revelation was written, but you see, what has come down to us as, as prophecy may is in effect be more of a of a of a memory of things that had happened before, but given the cyclical nature of time, will undoubtedly happen again. And see, this is what's different. With the advent of the Judeo-Christian tradition, time became linear. You had creation, you had the resurrection, you had judgment day. That's history. It's a, it's, it, it starts here, it ends here, right? The ancient model of time was cyclical, right? Now, not cyclical in the sense that everything gets repeated exactly, no. But cyclical in the same sense that, yeah, okay, it's spring now, then it's going to be summer. Well. This summer is going to be very similar to last summer, but it's going to be different. Some days will be cooler, some days will be warmer, some days will be rain, others won't, you know. The winter following, we know that we'll, as long as the current uh, conditions prevail, we know that the following winter is going to get cold again. And we can all be prophets because I can predict with 100% confidence that three months from now, the overall average temper of Georgia, temperature of Georgia is going to be warmer than now, right? Well, the ancients had this concept. They had a model. It was called the Great Year. And this is something that's come down to us for many generations. And it basically seems that the most likely explanation for it is the, the position of the Great Cosmic Cross, the equinoctial line, and the solstitial line rotating through the signs of the zodiac over a period of 26,000 years. And what's interesting is that when we use that as a clock and we start looking at events and we translate these events onto that clock, there's a very high degree of correlation. For example, if we go back exactly halfway through the system, 20, think 26,000 years, okay, halfway through the system would be 13,000 years ago. At that time, the vernal equinox was transiting out of Virgo into the constellation of Leo, and at 12,900 years ago, something happened. And that's what Graham has been writing about for 20 years now, is what happened. But something did happen. And see, the, the, his theories have been vindicated because something has been found that dates to 12,900 years. It's called the black matte layer. And it's named, it, it, it separates several horizons. It separates the Pleistocene Epoch from the Holocene Epoch. It separates the, uh, the Balling climate episode from the Younger Dryas episode. Culturally, it separates the Clovis culture from the Folsom culture. You had these different, different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, bodies of information that we're all looking at this same thing and realizing, hey, Clovis culture, Folsom culture. In between them is this black mat layer. Pleistocene geological epoch, Holocene, Holocene epoch, separated by this black mat layer. The, the, the Balling Alarad climate event separated from the Younger Dryas climate event by this black mat layer. Well, what is going on with this black mat layer? So they begin to look at it. Why was it black mat? because it was made up of a lot of carbon, carbonaceous material. And what would abundant carbon seem to suggest as its source? Fire. What'd you say? Fire. Fire. You got it. Fire. Yes. Widespread, intense fires. And this black mat has now been showing up in 
all over unglaciated North America, Central America. It's been found now in Venezuela. It's showing up in Europe. Now, along with the carbonaceous rich layer, they've been finding other things. Magnetic grains, microspherols, nano diamonds that can only be produced on Earth two ways. Laboratories and high, high pressure nuclear explosions. But volcanoes don't have enough pressure to do it. But here there are billions of these nano diamonds being found in this black matte layer. Nano diamonds, magnetic grains, microspherals, every one of those are fingerprints of something cosmic. Right? Now, we see that there was this tremendous megafauna that lived at the end of the last ice age. If we could transport ourselves back right now into the late Pleistocene, 15, say, thousand years ago, during the, the, the latter stages of the ice age, and we were here in Georgia, what kind of an environment would we find ourselves in? Well, the, the closest analog would be as if we were suddenly now transported to southern Canada, say Ontario. Large trees, alder trees, spruce trees, what are called northern or boreal forests were here. Just north of here, what was Kentucky, it was now Kentucky, was tundra, right? There were huge armadas of icebergs floating off the coast of uh, north and south and Carolina and Georgia, right? Sea level was 400 feet lower, so the coastline, the beaches were not where they are now. You'd have to go another 30, 40, 50 or more miles to get to the ocean, to get to the coastline. And then in these more northern forests, what would you find? You would find herds of mastodons, which are large hairy proboscideans, elephants. You would find a couple of species of woolly mammoth. You would find uh, giant beavers that might weigh five or six hundred pounds. You would find giant armadillos. You would find giant ground sloths that were the size of, of African elephants. You would find the, the American Pleistocene lion, which was the size of a horse. You would find the uh, uh, um, Arctotus simus, the giant short-faced bear, which stood six feet tall at the shoulder and was probably the most formidable predator of the Ice Age. So it would be an interesting place. And vastly, vastly different than now. Now, we have to picture that something was able to move the climate, and that's just our region, from that to what it is now. That's a pretty dramatic change. Mm -hmm. Again, I would ask somebody who says, the debate on climate change is over. You're a climate change denier. Like, excuse me, <laughs> I am not denying that the climate <laughs> changes, for God's sakes. In fact, I'm just the opposite, you see. But what I recognize is that the climate has gone through these extreme and extraordinary changes without any help from us. And what I'm suggesting is that the trigger, we have to look out, up and out, ultimately, to, to discover that trigger. And this is what the Grail authors, I think, are trying to get people to do, is to realize that what they're describing in these quests is really a cosmic process. Okay? That is cyclical. That is cyclical. Yes, that mm -hmm. is cyclical. And sometimes can be more severe, sometimes less severe. If we look at the event here, go back 12 to 13,000 years ago, that was accompanied by a mass extinction. All of these great megafauna that I was just describing disappeared. And they, they, were, they, they, they disappeared under that black matte layer. Okay, just like the, the little magic layer at the KT boundary 65 million years ago, you found dinosaurs below them but not above. When you look at the black mat layer, you find woolly mammoths below and saber-toothed cats below and all the rest but not above. You find the Clovis culture below but not above. Okay, so this is clearly a marker and it appears to be at least hemispheric in, in scale. I'm going to suggest before the research is all over, because it's now just in its infancy, we're going to see that what we're, it's, a, it's a global event. Because look, the species of animals disappeared in South America all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. All right. Now the number of species, the total number of species that disappeared 13,000 years ago, was depending on how you divide the species up, was about 120 species. Right? And these are mega mammals. We call mega mammals, which is any mammal over about 100 pounds in body weight. Right, 44 kilograms. So that includes 
just you know, think in your mind, what, what are the animals, name some animals more than 100 pounds in body weight. Lions, tigers, bears. bears. Oh my. I know. <laughs> See, I was setting you up for that. <laughs> Moose, caribou, antelope, right? Elephants, giraffes, rhinos, hippos, the list could go on and on. And there's about, well, roughly 120 species. Well, if we go back 15,000 years ago, the number of mega mammals, megafauna, was about double what it is now. You have to picture that. That was an enormous extinction event that occurred 13,000 years ago. That left, I mean, some estimates were that there might have been 10 or 12 woolly million woolly mammoths in the world, which is bizarre because some of the estimates for human population placed the human population less than the number of, of mammoths. And yet, for 50 years, the extinction of the mammoths has been blamed on Paleo-Indian hunters <laughs> using spears. And they took out 10 or 12 million woolly mammoths so quick that they couldn't even reproduce themselves in time. So some of the advocates of this idea have, have called it the Blitzkrieg hypothesis. And it was on its way out, but guess what, folks? It's been revived. Because I mentioned that there are, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in this last mass extinction of 13,000 years ago, doesn't even qualify as one of the five great ones in the history of the Earth. Because we're only basically looking at the top of the food chain. Got basically severed in half, right? Okay, well, when the dinosaurs disappeared at the Cretaceous Tertiary, at least three quarters of all species on Earth, land and sea, disappeared. At the Permian-Triassic, some estimates are as many as 95% of all species on Earth disappeared. In fact, some say that the Earth in that Permian-Triassic event came very close to being sterilized, right? Okay, now, we know that the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary event was caused by minimum of one great asteroid impact that hit the Yucatan of, South, of Central America, right? Indian geologists have discovered a giant crater that they're calling Shiva on the base on the bottom of the Indian Ocean. Shiva appears to be also 65 million years old. Then there's a couple of other craters, smaller ones in North America that are dating to the same time. What it appears is, is that that KT boundary was perhaps a period of clustered bombardment. Okay, now the one in, in the uh, Yucatan alone was estimated to be at least 100 million megatons, right? Now, uh, a megaton is a million tons of TNT. And your, the, 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 the bomb that they dropped on Hiroshima was considered to be 10 kilotons. Now, a kiloton is 1,000 tons of TNT, so that's 10,000 tons of, of TNT. So a megaton is a million. And if I divide that by 10,000, it means that a one megaton bomb would be equivalent to 100 Hiroshima's. Mm -hmm. Now the biggest bombs in the American arsenal at the peak of the Cold War were about 15 megatons, maybe 20, 20. Roughly about the same size in energy equivalents as the Tunguska explosion in Siberia in 1908. Now what's interesting about that is because when we scale up from our smallest atom bombs, which can wipe out a whole city, to a hydrogen bomb, we look at that scale, the top end of the most intense, powerful energy forces that humans have been able to uh, control is the bottom end of the cosmic scale. Because what we saw with Tunguska in 1908, again, that was a small cosmic speck, 150 feet in diameter, right? It's estimated that the energy released for this, with a single KT impact in the Yucatan was 100 million megatons. Now, if I go 100 million, 100 million, that's 100, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 100 million megatons, and I divide that, well, that's a, a big hydrogen bomb that could wipe out a city is one megaton. One megaton. Now, uh, as the scientists have looked, at the effects of that impact. They've looked at, uh, they've looked at for example, the amount of soot. Um, what was it? Wendy Wolbach, 
has done that. She did some of the very seminal work on that at the KT boundary back in the in the in the actually in the late eighties. She's also been involved in studying this black mat layer from thirteen thousand years ago. But she was the ones who did the estimates for how much soot was deposited along with the iridium globally. And based on the amount of soot, she then calculated how much biomass had to be incinerated in order to deposit that much soot. The amount of biomass, and of course at the late Cretaceous, the Earth was, had a greater density of biomass than now, but the biomass that she calculated was roughly equivalent to every plant on Earth today. In other words, what she documented was the, in the aftermath of that impact was a cosmic global, a global firestorm, right? That was then followed by a, a, sh a period of several weeks where everything was burning and, and, and uh, Levy, David Levy, co-discoverer co uh, of Shoemaker Levy 9, estimated that for a short period of time most of the Earth's surface was heated to broiling. That was then followed by, because of the vast amount of dust and particulate matter lofted into the atmosphere, was anywhere from three to five miles, three to five years of basically ice age temperatures, where there was basically nothing above freezing on the entire planet, right? The wonder of a lot of the people that have looked at this is, how did anything survive? Okay, now, if we look at the, the, the hierarchy of the great five, the Pleistocene extinction event of 13,000 years ago doesn't even qualify, okay? The great five, the KT is right in the middle, right in the middle. The late Devonian and the Ordovician Silurian are actually, or the Ordovician Silurian and the Permian Triassic are estimated to have been even more severe, right, in the great five. Well, there is now a movement, and some of you may have heard of this, and it's getting a lot of airplay in certain circles, and it's this, that humans are now provoking the sixth great mass extinction, equivalent to the previous great five. Exhibit A, to demonstrate the capacity of humans to cause mass extinction, they're calling up the Blitzkrieg hypothesis. They're saying, look, 13,000 years ago there was a mass extinction event and humans were responsible. Now, I'm very, very skeptical of that claim. And having now pondered and considered for a long period of time um, the effects of what, the energetic effects of an impact of something from space and what it does, I'm thinking, wait a second, now, global firestorms, darkening of the planet where for a year they're saying in large places around the planet you probably couldn't have seen your hand in front of your face. Uh, also because of the, the severity of the shock wave probably every fault line on earth collapsed. They're estimating that there could have been uh, earthquakes would have been measured on the Richter scale of 11 and 12 and you know how the Richter scale works it's logarithmic so that uh, 9 on the Richter scale is 10 times more severe than 8 on the Richter scale, right? Huge volcanic eruptions, okay, because like the Siberian traps in India was a gigantic uh, volcanic eruption that would have spewed sulfuric acid into the global atmosphere and caused acid rain with the pH of battery acid. All of this stuff, again, when you start putting all this together, a lot of the guys or people who've been looking at this in detail, how did anything survive this? You know, global, you know, firestorms, you know, global freezing, acid rain with pH of a battery acid, gigantic earthquakes, massive volcanic eruptions, right? And that was the middle of the Great Five. So when I hear somebody saying, we're in the midst of the sixth great mass extinction, now, my thought is, I think you need to get out more. <laughs> I think you just need to go outside a little more often because the last time I looked, there was not a global ice age descending on the earth. We've not just suffered through massive global firestorms. There's not acid rain with pH of battery acid, etc., etc., etc. Now, whether you accept that or not, and I certainly am not trying to say, hey, we humans should just, you know, wreck the environment wholesale. I'm just saying that really. If we're going to have a, a, a realistic environmentalism, it has to be 
again, based in reality. And, and we have to understand that this planet has come through stuff just unimaginable, unimaginable to our modern framework of thinking. You see, that's all I'm saying here is that, no, we can't really talk about, and, and, and understand this, when, when the environmental movement started, in the late 60s and early 70s, and I was very much into it. I was a volunteer at the first Earth Day in April 1970 and was, yeah, yeah, we need to take care of the environment. And I, of course, still believe that. Absolutely, I do. But at the, at the, at the dawning of the envi modern environmental movement, the model of Earth history was strictly uniformity, strictly gradualist, right? So if your model of Earth change is one grain of sand or one drop of water at a time, well, then, yeah, you could, from that perspective, yeah, well, what he, we humans are doing is an order of magnitude greater. You know, what we're doing really is having an imprint, and it no question is, right? But when you turn it around and you place it in the context of what we now know about Earth history, it wouldn't take much at all before the human imprint on Earth, gone. I mean, literally gone. And see, this brings now to the idea that, okay, if we humans have been around, modern humans have been around 150, 180,000 years, what has the planet endured in that period of time? Well, at least four ice ages have come and gone. Now, you know, when we were looking at that, looking at that graphic of the ice from the Atlantic to the Pacific and northern United States up to the Arctic Circle, bear in mind now, there's no trees growing there, is there? But if we go back 30,000 to 40,000 years ago, there were trees, there were forests. And somewhere around 26,000 years ago, the climate cooled very rapidly and the ice began to grow. Then by 18 or 20,000 years ago, it had swallowed up half the North American continent. Now, I think we would all be rightfully upset if somewhere along the line we decided, well, hey, you know what? Weyerhaeuser and other big timber companies, tell you what, you go in there and clear cut every single tree from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from the northern United States up to the tundra, take every single tree, clear cut everything, so there's nothing left. We'd be pretty upset, wouldn't we? Well, 25,000 years ago, nature did that. Nature erased 7 million square miles of forest with the swallowing up of that ice. And seven million miles uh, is like, oh, about 4,480,000,000 acres. So over 4 trillion acres of forests clear cut. And nature did it with no help from us. We gotta understand that this is, these things have happened. We have to have this context. And this is the context in which we are going to understand the grail. Because we have to know, we have to understand that the planet has gone through these episodes. Nature has been devastated. Uh, last October, the first thing that Brad and I did on our, our trip with Graham while we were waiting for Graham to arrive was we went up and visited Mount St. Helens. It was a very interesting trip. Because Mount St. Helens, that same year, significant year, 1980, remember, blew up in, in May of 1980, and it basically devastated, completely wiped out, converted to a, a, a barren lunar landscape, about, what, 250 square miles, something in that ballpark? Yeah, about a third, actually, of what the Tunguska event wiped out. But, oh, at least half of it now is completely reclaimed by forest. In another century, it'll, only the trained eye would recognize that there had been this tremendous catastrophe there 35 years ago, right? So that was very, very interesting to me, and that's something I've always been interested in, is how nature recovers in the aftermath of these events that we now know have happened. Well, part of it is this. Something, and, and we're going to get into this, and, and this lecture that I'm giving you tonight is the context for the next three lectures, when we really get back into the symbolism of the grail. Because you need to have this framework for really to understand, I think, what the grail is getting at, right? When these cosmic events happen, cosmic material is delivered to the Earth. Platinum group metals is one of the primary signatures. Platinum group metals seem to have very interesting interaction with the biosphere. 
right? There's also some interesting subtle hints and indications of the importance in, of platinum group metals in the alchemical transmutative processes, right? So one of the things that was noticed in the aftermath of Tunguska, now that we have access with the thawing of the Cold War in the early 90s, we were able, American scientists were able to communicate with Soviet scientists, Russian scientists, about a lot of their research into the region of the Tunguska explosion. And one of the things they had been documenting is that totally undocumented and new unprecedented species were showing up. Also that there was accelerated forest growth in certain areas that was inexplicable, like double and triple the enormous normal rate of forest growth. And they're trying to explain what is it that there's something in the, the cosmic constituents that must have catalyzed this, this, these kind of rapid uh, uh, changes, maybe even evolutionary changes. That now gets us up to the threshold of a very interesting area of research that has been gaining momentum in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And this is the idea of panspermia. The idea that perhaps life didn't originate on Earth itself, but was introduced from outside, right? Now, with what we've learned about picking up and studying meteorites on the ground, uh, making uh, rendezvous with comets, um, by picking up fr uh, fragments of asteroids that have fell to Earth, fallen to Earth, we basically now know, and, and particularly in the terms of comets, that comets can contain uh, very sophisticated organic materials, including amino acids and other things that would be the, the constituents of life, right? Frozen in these snowballs, if you will, that have come into inner space from deep space outside, way outside the orbit of Neptune. And they come in and it's very possible that not only the hydrosphere is the product of comets being delivered to the early silicate surface of the earth once it crystallized out of the molten state but also the organic the 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 organic catalytic material delivered into that watery matrix by this by the comets themselves and this has been an idea that's been around for a long time but has never gained mainstream acceptance until the last 10 years or so when it's now becoming apparent that yeah this stuff organic material comets are loaded with organic material and we now know that what, what they're calling extremophiles, a lot of this material seems to be able to survive uh, in intense uh, regimes of pressure and heat. Because that was one of all, always the big objections. Well, even if there was organic material in a comet or an asteroid, it would be destroyed in the impact. Well, guess what? We're discovering that that's not the case. See, Now, again, this has important implications for understanding the Grail mythos. And I want you to recall this image, and I'm going to pull it up here, and we're going to go, what, 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes? Yeah. We're going to spend on images. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Um, some that you've said as far as the ancient grail myths and stories, etc. do you think that, um, is, is, are you suggesting that how do you say go go back late Teppy um, might have hidden their structures or secrets to gift them to civilization when needed. Yes, I think it was done in, in this in this I concur with Graham on this that that yeah it was done to preserve it for the future. Right. Which and they I, saw the comet coming, right? Well, they very yeah that's very possible. Yes, and in fact I'm going to show you traditions that would very are very suggestive of that conclusion yes see and see I made the point uh, is that you know when Tunguska exploded in the atmosphere which is really worse than it hit in the ground in some respects you know when they when when they uh, when they detonated the when they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki those two bombs didn't actually like every most people would think a bomb falling hits the ground explodes that's not what happened it was blown up several miles up into the atmosphere so that the, it could have a greater radius of, of damage, right? Now, during the height of the Cold War, both sides, the Soviets and the, the Americans, 
had missile silos and hardened command and control centers. And what did they do? They buried them underground to, to, to protect them from the shock waves of things exploding in the atmosphere, right? It occurs to me that that would be a very plausible motive for those who buried Gobekli Tepe to preserve it from a Tunguska type event. And there are, there's a, there's a school of British neocatastrophists led by Victor Klub and, and William Napier in England, who for, since the early 80s, in fact, in 1978, they wrote a paper where they were proposing that the dinosaurs were taken out by something cosmic. But what they have been looking at is the, the see, because in, in America, they have focused on crater counts, right? Counting craters, and then from those crater counts, extrapolating how often the Earth gets hit, right? Most of those craters are going to be objects, like in the case of the famous crater in Arizona, right? Did, uh, have any of you ever been there outside of Winslow? Okay, road trip. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> There's a song about that. There's a song about that, <laughs> isn't there? Yes. <laughs> We won't get into that. Uh, I suddenly had this picture of a girl driving a flatbed Ford for some reason. And I can't, I'm trying to get that out of my mind. <laughs> oh, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Okay, so in Turkey, they've also recently discovered an underground city that couldn't like 20,000 people live there? It was something ridiculous. Yeah about the number of people who could live there. Yeah, and how old was it? That was my question. Was, oh. it, was it from, I mean, it's, how ancient is that city? I don't know, and it, but you're not talking about Gobekli Tepe in no. Turkey, because that's in Turkey. No, I'm not talking about okay. Gobekli okay. Tepe, okay. but there are underground cities. An underground city, yeah, I don't know. Somebody sent me an email link about that recently, and I haven't even looked at it yet. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I strive to know everything and the answer to every question. <laughs> However, I fail miserably. Uh, but yeah, okay, you see here? This, this is, to me, it's all right here. You see, this is the hydrosphere. The chalice is the crater, right? This is the cosmic material being delivered into the crater. This is, and see, when, when something strikes the Earth, you have to bear in mind, that it's very possible that many of the fault lines around the planet were caused by great impacts because it's clear, you know, if, if I, you know, if I walked up to your car with a hammer and smashed the windshield and you looked at it, you'd see this point of impact and you see all kinds of cracks radiating out from it. And it wouldn't take much for you to go, hey, something of a very, this was a catastrophe here of some type, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, same thing. When you have these great impacts into the lithosphere, it fractures the lithosphere. Now, those fracture lines create lines of least resistance for the fluids, primarily water, for the hydrosphere to percolate and move through the rock layers, right? This card captures the, that scenario perfectly. Here's the crater. Here is the cosmic material being delivered from the heavens by this messenger, of the heavenly messenger, into the crater. The streams of water are flowing out and entering into the atmosphere. It's also raining out in the form of these drops, right? And then what you see down here is plant life beginning to emerge from the water, the lotus, typically, which is the symbol of, you know, of life and fertility. And so it's right here in the card. What's the hand? I don't know. Who is that? Somebody. But that's, see, then I, I use the term uh, panspermia, which is the idea that life was delivered. Well, Chandra Wickrama Singh, along with Fred Hoyle, who were some of the, I think, who coined that term way back in the 70s and 80s. Chandra Wickrama Singh, who's a brilliant astrophysicist, his thinking has evolved so where he's now calling it directed panspermia. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe whoever designed this card was entertaining the same kind of an idea. But we'll leave that as a mystery for right now. Who the hand belongs to. Are you familiar with the Rock of Judicula up in North Carolina? I'm only familiar. I've never visited it. Have you? Yes, several times. 
Now, would you say that there's any inscriptions on there that oh. would be pertinent to this discussion? Well, yeah. For, for a long time, my first couple of visits, I always thought that the inscriptions were uh, cosmic references just to stars and planets and, and constellations and that sort of thing. And a few years ago, I saw I was looking up some stuff to show somebody, and I found a web page of some researcher, an American researcher, who took brand new equipment, the latest equipment of, of microphotography of organisms and germs and um, viruses and paired them next to quite a few of the inscriptions on the Rock of Judicula. Uh -huh. Mitochondria, all sorts of stuff. And they were exact. Really? They were perfectly exact. Yeah, see, I need to see that. So that was a, a new perspective I've got. But it goes along with this consideration of the, the what do you call it, transpermia? Uh, pan, panspermia. Which I have thought longer than I've known about the Rock of Judicula. So it was a big surprise to me to see both of those things together. Who knows? And that, yeah, well. But, but it does make sense. And, and I mean, this guy used the latest equipment to show these photographs. I would like to see that. Microscopic stuff. I've, I've, I keep saying to myself, we need to go up there and have What's a look. <clears throat> Ju uh, the Rock of Judicula. Judicula. It's up near Cashiers. When we look at the, the, the legacy of climate change over the last couple of hundred thousand years, we see something interesting. Is that that we look at, at graphs of glaciers and interglacial ages, and what we see is that the periods of interglacial warmth are actually in the last, say, two to three hundred thousand years, have been the exceptional times. Been exceptional times. And in fact, the longest period of interglacial warmth in the last 250,000 years is the one we're in now. Mm -hmm. The Holocene. That's the one we're in right now. Right, so that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say in correlation with sacred geometry and the periods between these cosmic events, do you see any connection with the sacred geometry? Oh yeah. The, 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 the five platonic solids embody in degree measurements all of the sacred numbers that mark the temporal cycles. So for example, the dodecahedron is, consist, is, is 12 faces, right? Each of them are pentagonal. So, a pentagon has five sides and it's 108 angles, 108 degrees between each pair of sides, right? Because it's obviously a little bit greater than 90. It's 108. Mm -hmm. So there's five sides, five angles, 108 times 5 is 540. And then there are 12 sides. So if I go 540 mm -hmm. times 12 for the total number of degrees measuring the dodecahedron, it's that number right there. Would you read that out? 6,480. 6,480. Now, 6,400 years ago, something happened. The climatologists call it the neoglaciation. And in the aftermath of the great uh, ice age event that happened when the, when the ice melted down, after this tremendous cold, you have to picture, here's what happened. Around 14,000, 15,000 years ago, the climate began to go through a gentle warming. And the massive glaciers that had covered so much of North America and Northwestern Europe during, like, peaked in the age of Scorpio between 18 and 19,000 years ago. It began to slowly shrink back. And the climate began to warm, right? And as the glaciers began to shrink back, the Clovis culture began to follow the, the retreating ice mass. So did the great megafauna. However, after about a millennium of that, this nice gentle pace got interrupted suddenly, 12,900 years ago. 
boom, the hammer came down. And this was when chaos reigned for the next 1400 years on Earth. And the climate shifted back into an episode of full glacial cold called the Younger Dryas. And it was, and then at 11,600 years ago, the Younger Dryas came to a sudden end. And it was in that 1400 year period that all the great megafauna disappeared. So going into it at 12,900, okay, they were all there. Coming out of it, half of them were gone. Now, once most of the ice melted and sea levels came back up, the climate shifted into a phase called the hypsothermal, which used to be called the climatic optimum. Most estimates are that average global climate was anywhere between one and three degrees warmer than now. This period was during a period that Maria Gimbutas, if you've heard of her, the famous archeologist who wrote the book, The Civilization of the Goddess, she wrote a book about this period, which is called by archeologists, the Neolithic, the early Neolithic, which lasted from about 6,500 years ago, as most dates, up to about 9,000 to 10,000 years ago. And basically what you've got to picture is this. In the aftermath of these great world-shaking events that eliminated the woolly mammoths, do you think that the other species, including humans, that came through that episode, came through unscathed, an event that could terminate, completely eliminate four of the six species of elephants on the earth completely, do you think it left the other two species completely unscathed? Now, in North America, like I said, we lost the... The giant, the cave bears, we lost the giant armadillos, the beavers, the, the three types of elephants that lived in North America. But do you think that the other animals that were here, the moose, the grizzly bear, the black bear, those, do you think that they came through completely unscathed? No, of course not. And there's evidence that, the clo that there was a population crash as well. The Clovis culture disappeared, right? So now, in the millennium, in the aftermath of this, sea levels have come back up rapidly at first, then slowing down, and slowly the coastlines of the planet begin to stabilize. The present climatic regime comes into, into existence, but it's actually warmer than now. So that some places up by the, uh, the, the tree line was two and three hundred miles further north than it now is. Agriculture, when you were to, some of these abandoned agricultural terraces, go back to this time of the goddess, when we find all of these effigies of a corpulent, fertile, pregnant goddess. Because coming out of the disasters at the end of the Ice Age, it was almost like that was the traumatic birth of the modern age of the world. And in the aftermath of that traumatic birth, it's almost as if nature gave us a 3,000 year interval of a paradisial garden-like existence for the human, human population to recover. And so what you had there was, as Maria Gimbutas has, has documented, for 3,000 years, there's no evidence of human conflict. No, no paintings of warfare and battles, no, no fortified encampments, no palisades, no weapons that were clearly used for warfare. And when do those things start showing up? Usually the dates are given between 6,000 and 6,500 years ago what the climatologists are starting calling the neoglaciation. See, because after 3,000 years of this unprecedented warmth, suddenly the world got cold again. Now what would happen if, you got, if you're living in a valley at 10,000 feet above sea level and been farming and your community has been there for 3,000 years and all of a sudden, you know, a modern analog might be what happened to the Viking colonies on Greenland. They were there during the middle of a warm period, right? But when the Little Ice Age came on, they got frozen out and they became extinct. The Greenland colonies became extinct because of the cold. This is what was a, a smaller scale version of what happened 6,500 years ago. The cold came in. You see that the, the tree lines got depressed. The, the, the level at which agriculture could be practiced depressed. The growing season compressed. The, the, the belt so what would this do to settled human communities that had been there for 3,000 years? It totally disrupted the human population. And guess what we see in the aftermath of this disruption is conflict. Conflict comes back into the world. And we begin to see the emergence of fortified cities, you see. 
So we had 3,000 years of this age of the goddess. And interestingly, we see the, the religious orientation of people shifting from fertile earth goddess to wrathful sky god. Now, what do you think that's implying? So, I want you to think about these things and try to remember much of it, all of what we've talked about tonight as you can because it's going to provide the context for everything that's going to come in the next three lectures. Um, getting into this idea of the grail as technology for restoring the world, restoring the landscape in the aftermath of a catastrophe. Now, nature is going to do it itself, but just like the alchemists, doing something that accelerates that process and not only restores the king, the representative of all people, but the land, the kingdom as well, see. And we'll get into the specifics of that. And I'll just show you two more slides before we go for the night. But as long as this one's up here, I might as well comment for a second on it. A number of things. Who's that there sleeping? Jacob, yes, with his head on a, on a stone, right? Well, he's dreaming, and there's a ladder going up to heaven. And a broken sword. A broken sword, yes. Oh. Yes. Mm. We see angels ascending and descending the ladder. But we also see some other interesting things. We see seven stars up there. That's going to be a motif we come back to over and over and over again, the seven stars that shows up. And we have this column here, and you'll notice there's a vine winding around. That vine forms a helix, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's climbing from the ground up towards the sky, isn't it? And over here we have a crescent moon, but now you've got to look really close or you're not going to see it. What's right there? The comet. The comet. There's oh. your clue. Oh. All right. Does the vine represent the DNA? Well, that might be stretching it, but maybe not. I mean, you know, because it's, it's a helix, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, and, and here it's clearly a symbol of life. All right, this is now this is from alchemy, but it is the secret of the Grail right here. Okay, what you see here is this banner cross with some Latin and writing in it, which you won't necessarily get into now. But you notice there's two trees, and one has solar orbs and one has lunar crescents on it, right? And when you go to Chartres Cathedral and you look at the two, two, the two towers, one has a big solar orb and the other has a lunar crescent on it, right? And you go inside and the pillar down below has the cup, the grail cup, with the two phoenix dragons drinking from it. What did the phoenix dragons represent? In, in, in the stories, what was the phoenix? Rising right? from the ashes. Rising from the ashes, exactly. The restoration, okay? Now, what we have here is a dragon that this androgynous figure is holding. You see it's half male and half female. And down below, we have a circuit. And you see the water flowing under the trees, flows into this two-headed dragon, right? Flows in here, this is Draco, flows in, flows out. And here, the, the stream of water is actually blood. Because the alchemist wants the, the aspirant to alchemy, alchemical mystery, to make this connection between the circulation of water through the earth and the circulation of blood through the human physiology. You see how it's flowing between these two trees that are bearing this fruit. This is the secret right here. And so, when you think back to the car that I showed you, with the water, think of the water circulating through the earth. And what you'll see here, and this is where we'll pick it up next week, I mean next month, is getting into the specifics of this, this science of reclamation. We're going to get into talking about the, uh, the PGMs, such as platinum and iridium, and how they get delivered to the earth. We've seen some of this, but we'll revisit it to, to, to make sure that you don't. We'll look at the connection between um, human DNA and the catalytic effect of the PGMs. Uh, and we'll look at some really interesting esoteric 
doctrines, and then we'll talk about the cosmic life force. Many names for the cosmic life force, right? And then we will get into looking at some of the work of modern researchers that I think have relevance to understanding this phenomena, such as this. Electric field column produced by accumulating tectonic stress in subsurface regions. Now, next time. Next time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This is this is this is just a sneak preview of, and then we'll get into the work of this man. How many of you are familiar with Wilhelm Reich? Yes. Yes, and his work uh, in working with. Uh, Are you familiar with this at all? This is some really interesting <laughs> stuff. So we'll be getting it because his work really was, I think, a rediscovery of certain of the key tenets of the, the Grail technology. Mm. So we'll be tying that in. Because what he found was right here on this one. And this will be our last thing, then we'll go. The operation of the Cloud Buster, according to Wright, differs from that of the lightning rod on four points. First, its purpose is to draw orgone energy, which is the, the life energy, out of the atmosphere and clouds, but slowly and in small amounts at a time. Its action is not immediate as with a lightning rod. Second, its pipes are longer, at least four meters long, and they are hollow, not solid. Third, their aim is to trigger a flow of atmospheric orgone energy in a specific direction. Theoretically, once the direction of flow has been established, it will continue that way until another artificial or natural stimulus changes it. Fourth, and perhaps most significantly, the pipes draw the charge to water, preferably the flowing water of brooks, lakes, and rivers, and I might also add the subterranean waters as well. Wright found that the attraction between water and orgone is very strong. Ah, which is important clue for you to take home and remember for next month when we're talking about the circulation of water and the idea of the function of what he's calling the cloud buster and the orgone accumulators we'll see is, has exact parallels in the ancient sacred structures that were erected over the subterranean water courses. Interesting. Uh -huh. Interesting. So. Thank you. Thank you.